Thank you. We are lucky that uh, the workshop takes, takes place today, as uh, last week, this day, it was full of snow. Now we have lovely, lovely weather, enabling you to come from all over. The first session will give us an introduction to the field of historical GIS. And the first talk will be by Professor Richard Rubin from the Department of Geography at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, the same department as, as myself. He's one of uh, Israel's leading historical geographers, and he will give us an overview about historical geography in Israel. Uh, thank you, Noam, and good morning, everybody. Um, I think, and I'll go back to it uh, in the last uh, paragraph of my uh, uh, presentation, that this is uh, a great opportunity to uh, hopefully move from the more uh, conservative way of historical geography to, uh, to uh, a rather more modern way. And I, uh, when I prepared this um, uh, presentation, I found myself, unfortunately, belong to the old way. So uh, uh, I'll try to uh, uh, describe things in, from this perspective. When we try to define historical geography as a subfield in geography, we should probably follow Kant who is often quoted saying that history is the science of time, while geography is the science of space. And hence, historical geography is the study of space and places in it within a defined period of time. If we accept this definition, then one of the basic questions of historical geography should, should be where exactly is the location in which certain events occurred in a certain period of time and of course, why they occurred then and there. Applying this question to this country, Israel, Palestine, the Holy Land, would in the first place be to identify geographically certain, places, st certain place names that were mentioned in the Bible or in other historical sources. The earliest study, the earliest study of historical geography of Palestine was carried out, or at least we can think of it as an historical uh, geography study, was carried out from this viewpoint around the year 300 CE by Eusebius, the bishop of uh, Caesarea Maritima, in his famous book, The Onomasticon. In this book, he listed all the place names mentioned in the Holy Scriptures arranged from A to Z in each and every book of the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation and gave a short lexical article on each of them <coughs> and added something. In, this, in these articles, he referred first to the Bible and later <coughs> he often commented on their location and situation in his days. For example, this is only the um, uh, Greek which is Eusebius, and the Latin, which is uh, uh, the translation of uh, St. Jerome, that I will come to it in a moment, and we will see it in English as well in a moment. Arad, an Amorite town located by the desert of Kadesh, and still today a village at the fourth mile from Moleata, Malchata in the Negev, in the uh, eastern part of Bikat Beersheba, and 20 uh, miles from Hebron in the tribe of Judea. So we have both the biblical definition and the uh, uh, late Roman Byzantine definition of uh, Arad that I brought as an example. Eusebius' work was translated in the fifth century <coughs> into Latin by Jerome and became, became widespread among medieval scholars all over Europe under the name of Liber Locorum. Uh, um, this manuscript is from the uh, uh, collections of the uh, 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 National Library uh, presenting St. Jerome and his favorite dog uh, sitting in his uh, study and uh, writing something. He, he wrote so many uh, books, so uh, we have to uh, really to presume that this is, is when he wrote the liberal code. Nobody can, of course, uh, uh, say that. 
I should probably comment that a modern scientific edition was uh, published in Greek and Latin in Leipzig, 1904, and two different English translations were published in uh, 2003 and 2005, and you can see uh, uh, both of them, and I, th I think that I brought the translation also to uh, English of the same uh, rad. The upper one is uh, a surprise version bringing Greek, Latin, and English, and the lower one is uh, the authorization bringing only um, a uh, translation of the Greek and the Latin straight uh, to uh, English. <coughs> the onomasticon, in its Latin form of liberal quorum, had a great influence on medieval Christi Christian scholarship. However, in this period, the, in medieval times, the study of the Holy Land was almost entirely abstract. Centuries later, during the Renaissance and the age of humanism, <coughs> European scholars used it as the basis of their work on what they called Geographica Sacra, the sacred uh, geography, referring to the Holy Land, which was a common term for uh, treatises on the history and geography of the Holy Land. In these works, Scholars who were well versed in the scriptures and in classical sources strove to define the specific locations of the many places mentioned in these sources. We can refer, for example, to uh, my favorite is uh, Christian uh, van Adrichom, who in, 19, who in 1590 published a large book about the Holy Land called Theatrum Terrae Sanctae et Biblicorum Historiorum. He arranged in his book from A to Z, this time from Asher to Zabulun, and listed the place names in each tribe also from A to Z. Following the old model of Eusebius Jerome, he added a multitude of information from later periods. He also added a series of maps of each tribe, included a large map of um, um, Terra Promissionis, <coughs> dotted with numerous biblical sites. For example, if we will go to the details, this is the, um, um, the Red Sea, or the Gulf of uh, Suez in modern terminology, and the route of the wanderings uh, uh, in the desert, the 40 years of wandering, and in order to, uh, um, <coughs> in order, in order to put the uh, 40 stations of the wanderings, he uh, meandered, meandered the, the route is meandering all around. This is, for example, Mount Carmel with uh, Elijah standing here next to the uh, altar and here uh, killing the uh, priest of the uh, uh, Baal and, um, uh, uh, okay. And, and you can see so many uh, examples of uh, these uh, many um, traditions, biblicals and biblical and Christians on um, um, Adrichom's map. Adrichom was not alone in uh, this field of scholarship. A short while before him, Benedictus Arius Montanus prepared a large study of the Holy Land as uh, part of his Biblia Polyglota, and similar, similar works were published soon by others. The book by uh, Thomas Fuller, London, 1650, entitled by the symbolic title, A Pisgah Site of Palestine. Pisgah is, of course, the Hebrew biblical name of Mount Nebo, uh, presenting probably himself or his reading like Moses standing from abroad, from far away, and uh, looking at the, uh, the land of Israel from uh, Mount Nebo. Uh, and he added a large map and many other maps of the allotments of the tribes. You can see uh, his map, the Jordan coming from the uh, dried up lake of Hula, which is partly uh, uh, reflooded these days. The uh, Jordan 
this this uh, uh, non-realistic uh, uh, ouch that the uh, uh, Jordan River <coughs> is making was uh, very common on many books. The Sea of Galilee and the Jordan going down all the way to the uh, Dead Sea <coughs> with the uh, four destroyed uh, city of uh, Sodom and, Amor and, and Gomorrah uh, burning like uh, uh, large bonfires, uh, the Mediterranean shore and the uh, allotments of the tribes cut <coughs> here. So uh, this is uh, uh, Thomas Fuller's example. Uh, Adriano Srilandi uh, uh, published his book in 1714 and uh, many, many more, and his book is also, uh, has many maps in it, and <laughs> the most famous uh, among the French is Augustin Calmet, who wrote this uh, dictionary of the uh, Holy Scriptures that was uh, first published in 1711 and was uh, translated into, uh, besides the French, Latin, German, Italian, English, and maybe other languages that I'm not aware of. However, the first scholar who used the term historical geography was Edward Wells, the English uh, Edward Wells, who in 1711-1712 uh, uh, published three volumes of an historical geography of the Old Testament. And you can see that Modern editions are still being uh, published. This is uh, uh, the title page of the first edition, probably the first, I'm not sure even, and, and uh, modern editions are still uh, being published today. In 1799, Napoleon led a military campaign from Egypt along the eastern coast of the Mediterranean and failed, as we all know, to uh, uh, conquer Acre. Following this event, Palestine drew considerable attention in the European public sphere. Napoleon's engineer, engineers prepared a map of Palestine which formed the last part of the large map of uh, Egypt altogether in 47 uh, sheets and added the geographical <laughs> aspect, geographical aspect to the uh, geopolitics of this region. Moreover, in the years to come, during the 19th century, important changes gradually occurred in the Turkish Empire and especially in the Levant. Among these, I will mention only uh, some of them, were improvements in the level of security and inequality of transportation, the opening of European consulates, and more. All of these <coughs> facilitated the journey and encouraged Western scholars to embark upon research expeditions in both numbers and scope which had not been witnessed before. The first two uh, German travelers of the 19th century were the German uh, Zetzen and the Swiss Johann Ludwig uh, Burkhardt, who only passed through Palestine on the way from Syria to Egypt. Actually, both had uh, much further ideas uh, uh, Zetzen tried to uh, reach Mecca and uh, uh, Burkhard wanted to go along the Nile southbound in order to find the sources of the uh, Nile much before the uh, Stanley Livingstone uh, uh, affair. However, both died while they were uh, still on the uh, mission. Um, Zetzen uh, died somewhere in Arabia, we don't know exactly where, and uh, Burkhard died in uh, Cairo. However, their systematic work set high standard to future travelers who followed, their, uh, who followed them later. Each of them kept a detailed diary, they measured sites and created sketch maps, they collected specimens of almost everything they encountered geological, botanical, zoological samples, as well as manuscripts and artifacts were sent back home. And thus, although both had died while still on their mission, their achievements were published later by uh, others. 
From the viewpoint of historical geography, the most prominent traveler was probably Edward Robinson. Robinson, an American professor of theology and Semitic languages, traveled with Eli Smith, a missionary from Beirut who was well versed in Arabic. Together, they traveled in 1839 from Egypt, across Sinai to Aqaba, and from there throughout the whole country from its southern tip to the north. Their findings were described in a book called Biblical Researches in Palestine, which was published in both English and German. Ten years later, they returned on a second voyage, which was described in a second book named Later Biblical Researches in Palestine, and in some of the later editions, you will find them together in a three volume, uh, a three volumes uh, set. Robinson's contribution to historical geography of Palestine was enormous and is regarded by many as the founder of modern biblical geography. Throughout his travel, he paid close attention to the Arabic place names and identified them with biblical names. His method was based on the phonetical and <laughs> philological principles. Thus, he identified the Arabic Bir Sabba with biblical Bir Sheva, Tanuk with Tanakh in the Israel Valley, Jenin with Ein Ganim, etc. Robinson was also well aware of the biblical context. He did, of course, make some mistakes, some of them very peculiar, he put Kadesh Barnea in the uh, northern Arava instead of the uh, western uh, side of the Negev on the border of Sinai, and some other um, very peculiar um, mistakes, but many of his identification still stand today. About 20 years later, during the 1870s, a significant advance was made when two large-scale surveys were carried out. The first was carried out by the team sent by the Palestine Exploration Fund, an organization which was founded in London in 1865, especially for the study of, of, <coughs> the, of Palestine and its surrounding areas. The team was led by uh, uh, Claude Renier Conder and by Horatio Kitchener, which later was very famous in Egypt and Sudan. Two young officers of the Royal Engineers who measured the country from Tyre to Beersheba, created a detailed map in the scale of an inch to a mile, <coughs> and uh, published a series of volumes of memoirs dedicated to Galilee, Judea, Jerusalem, Galilee, Samaria, Judea, Jerusalem, the flora and fauna, fauna Arabic names, and special papers. And <coughs> their measurement is actually the first well-based, the first accurate map of the uh, uh, whole country. And in uh, this series of volumes, a lot of information about settlement, villages, archaeology, um, epigraphy, and whatever your politics and whatever you can think of is, is available. The second large-scale survey was made almost solely by this French nobleman, Victor Guerin, <coughs> uh, who also um, surveyed the country through and through. Both Condor Kitchener and Guerin paid a strict and careful attention to the archaeological remains and to the ide identification of ancient place names using Robinson's methodology and improving it. Guerin added also the use of Catholic traditions documented by the Franciscan friars and often including, included critical discussions about them. We can take a quick look at the uh, server of Western Palestine of the area northeast of Jerusalem. Uh, Jerusalem is here and we will take a closer look at this area, and we will find how they identified uh, uh, Mahmas with uh, uh, Mahmas with biblical Michmash, Jaba with Geva, and 
Anatta with uh, Anatot, the hometown of the uh, famous prophet Jeremiah. Due to um, um, Robinson's methodology and recent findings of these surveys, biblical geography flourished during the first half of the 20th century. The leading names were the three A's, Albert Alt, the German Albert Alt, the French uh, Dominican father uh, Abel, and the American uh, William Folksville Albright. Uh, each and every one of them is a great name in the uh, archaeology and biblical geography uh, of uh, this country. With the advancement of archaeological research, biblical historical geography in particular, and historical geography in general, developed a well-established methodological concept that was based on three basic elements. A site should be identified with a place name cited in historical sources if its Arabic name is similar phonetically or sometimes in its meaning and not only in its uh, sound to the ancient name. There are archeolog archeological remains from the relevant period and it is located in accordance to the geographical situation that is described on, in the sources. It should be, if, if the Bible uh, described the site on uh, um, top, top of the mountain, it should be on the top of the mountain. And if it is in the valley, it should be uh, in the valley or near the seashore, etc. With the development of Jewish-Israeli academic uh, research, the two leading scholars who were also the two A's, appeared on the stage. These were uh, uh, Michael uh, Aviona and Yohanan Aroni. <coughs> Both were involved in the composition of the historical atlases that known in Hebrew as the uh, Atlas Carta and uh, in English the uh, Macmillan Bible Atlas that turned to be a, a standard uh, reference work for uh, every student of the Holy Land and, and Bible all over the world. And both had published the works or books that uh, were entitled Historical Geography. Yohanan Aroni wrote his book, The Land of the Bible, Histo a historical geography on the, Bi on the biblical period. And uh, Aviona, his book is, uh, is uh, The Holy Land and Historical Geography from the Persian to the Arab conquest, and uh, he is well known, at least in Israel, for being the creator of the model of Jerusalem in Second, Temp in second Temple period that for many years was near the uh, Holy Land Hotel and is now in the uh, um, Israeli Museum. However, both perceived historical geography as a combination between geography, which was defined in their book as a static element, the unchanged stage upon which history, which is the dynamic element, staged the ever-changing play of the human past. Thus, classical historical geography in Israel was conceived as a systematic study <coughs> which strove to locate the sites of the ancient places, identify the ancient names, and create a modern map designated, designating their location. In 1970, Joshua Benarier published an article in which he criticized this methodology, claiming basically that geography is not and never was a static element. He suggested a different approach to historical geography an approach which he called geographical historical geography or historical geography of geographers. Although he was a former student of Aviona and Aroni, he had been educated as a geographer. He therefore strove to understand and explain the significance of remains from the past within the context of present landscape. He started with the Bet Guvrin caves and then uh, the Sea of Galilee and many more. And not necessarily within archaeological context. He soon abandoned, he soon broadened his scope 
of the research to the reconstruction of past periods and places, to the analysis of geographical issues as transportation, settlement, and population in the past and more. And he himself uh, dedicated much of his, res his research to um, uh, the 19th century and later to the uh, 20th century, to the British Mandate period. In order to do so, he borrowed from methodologies of, of the British Clifford Darby, the American Carl Sauer, Andrew Clark, and many others. Benarier was not only a scholar, but also an academic leader. And he led a, <coughs> a large group of students, many of them, including me, if I may, uh, turned to be scholars in Israel University. Benaya's new methodological approach, which focused on the study of geographical elements in past periods in historical geography, was thus adopted and developed in Israel. The new and growing group uh, <coughs> has been working for many years side by side with the group of the archaeological historical uh, geographers, and uh, who, which also continue uh, to uh, produce important works. Both of these groups continue to work using a common title, historical geography, yet going in quite different directions. Some of the works that historical geographers from Benaya's school published dealt with smaller or with specific type of settlement, such as the works of Van Aronson, who is sitting there, and Yossi Benazzi on Moshevot. Some worked on medium scale, like uh, Woodcock work on uh, Jaffa in Jerusalem. Yet other worked on a regional basis and covered the scope of several hundred years, like my, mine in, about the uh, ancient uh, uh, Negev tombs. Most of the research was uh, <coughs> conducted Examine, examining a cross section during a certain period. Although the vertical diachronic section is considered, of course, as, as an accepted approach as well. Most of the rich research that was done so far in this group was carried out, as I said in, my, in the beginning, by conservative methods, archival studies, field surveys, analysis of old maps and documents, air photographs, Etc. I think that we are more than ready for a new generation of scholars and studies which will adopt new methodolo me methodologies, HGIS being one of them, probably a leading one between them, which will instill new energy in our group. I was theref therefore glad to accept Noam Levin's invitation uh, to give this paper, and I'm looking forward to uh, gaining new insights in this uh, workshop. Thank you. I'm pleased to invite Professor uh, Ian Gregory, he's Professor of Digital Humanities in Lancaster University of the UK. He wrote uh, several textbooks about historical GIS, which you may know, and he's one of the leading persons in the UK in, the, uh, in this approach. Thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, thank you for inviting me. This looks like it's going to be a really interesting uh, meeting, a really interesting workshop. So um, what I'm going to do in this talk uh, is give a fairly, um, fairly technically based overview about what GIS is and what I think it has to offer to history, study of history, and perhaps uh, to the humanities more generally. And I suspect David Bodenhammer afterwards is going to come at the same kind of issues, but much more from a humanities-based approach rather than the technical, uh, the technical approach that I'm going to give. So when we're thinking about uh, GIS and what it has to offer to history, there's uh, probably two different ways that we can approach the question. We can approach it from, if you like, a bottom-up approach, which um, thinks about what the, what the technology is and how it, how it models the world and how perhaps these can be applied to the study of history. And we can think at it much more from a uh, top-down approach, which asks the question about what does this have to offer uh, to, to history and to the humanities more generally. And I'm going to try and uh, give a quick run through both of those uh, in, this, in this talk. Um, 
I'm going to introduce quite a lot of the technical jargon as well, which uh, if you're familiar with, with GIS, you may already, uh, already know, but if you're not, I hope will be helpful. But at the same time, I'm going to try not to be too technical about things. So starting with the bottom-up approach, uh, the te technology-based approach. Uh, if we're going to think about what GIS is, geographical information systems are, then the first thing we really have to think about is what is geographical information? What is geographical information? In many ways, just about any type of information can be thought of geographical information because it's information that refers to a location on the Earth's surface. But really, if, uh, if it's going to be geographical information, I think it's fair to say that the thing we have to be interested in is how it varies across the Earth's surface, whether it's on a very local scale, like a city, or whether it's on a much broader scale, like a continent, or maybe even the whole world. So if we're going to have information uh, that does that, then uh, if you think about it, the information has to have two different components. It has to have a thematic component that tells you about what is at the particular place, and it also has to uh, have a spatial component that tells you where you're referring to. So a good, uh, a good example of a type of data that does that uh, is census data. Census data, if you think about it, splits the, the country or whatever it's interested in into uh, administrative areas of one form or another, districts, par par uh, parishes, municipalities, counties, whatever it may be, uh, which have precisely defined boundaries. And then it counts the number of people within those boundaries. So you're able to see how the number of people in one area compares to the number of people in the next with the next and so on. It's fairly, uh, in some ways, a fairly obvious form of geographical information. Hospitals admissions data, say we're interested in mortality or morbidity patterns in the past, hospitals admissions data may also be a slightly less obvious form of uh, geographical information. Uh, if you have more than one hospital, you know where those hospitals are, so uh, you're then able to say how the admissions uh, are perhaps the numbers of deaths, number of uh, people with, Ill with certain types of illnesses, uh, how the different admissions at different hospitals give you an insight into how disease patterns or mortality patterns varied across the city or the country that you're interested in. Another example might be relief data, data on heights which come from contours. The contours join lines of equal heights, so uh, where the contours run is the spatial side, and the thematic side is simply how high these, uh, these places are. Uh, transport networks are another example. Uh, where the transport networks run and perhaps information on the type of road, the flow of traffic down it, those sorts of things would give you your thematic side. Those four are, if you like, the, the fairly traditional forms of geographical information. If we're interested in history, or we're interested in the humanities, then uh, we also need to include uh, perhaps more complicated, more difficult uh, types of sources as well. And I'll be saying a little bit about these later. Uh, so most humanities sources uh, are actually based around texts. Um, and texts can also be thought of as geographical information because if the texts have information about specific places, so they have place names in it, then those places, those place names are giving you information about uh, the, th the spatial side and what they're saying about those places gives you information about the thematic side. Similarly and lastly, um, a collection of photographs or a collection of paintings of buildings might also be uh, geographical information. If we know where those photographs were taken either from or of, that gives you a spatial side. And the photographs or paintings themselves gives you a thematic side. So it's this link between both having the thematic side and the spatial side that uh, helps us to define geographical information. So then a geographical information system is simply a a software tool um, that uh, allows us to uh, allows us to model information in that uh, in that type of format. Three ways of thinking about it. The the simplest, and most basic, is perhaps as a type of software. Uh, it's a type of software that has all the functionality of a database management system, so something like Microsoft Access or even something as basic as Excel. But it also has, it adds the functionality to manipulate the spatial component. So in other words, it's effectively uh, a combination between a database management system and a computer mapping system. And that provides us with a toolkit, a toolkit of things that we can do with data in this format. Uh, the toolkit allows us to do things like manipulate data spatially, so calculate distances and adjacencies, <coughs> change projections, integrate data from disparate sources. 
It allows us to do things like analyse the data spatially, so taking into account how close things are to each other uh, as, part, as an explicit part of our analysis. And it also allows us to visualise data. GIS involves a lot of mapping, uh, but it also uh, can involve more uh, other forms of visualisation, so things like tables, graphs, uh, animations, virtual landscapes, and that sort of thing. And those two things together really allow GIS, or GI science as it's sometimes referred to, to be an approach to exploring data, exploring topics, both in conventional ways, but also geographically as well. And it, to doing, doing that is kind of a challenge, because what you're doing is taking a, a technology that was devised very much in the earth sciences, in the military, and in areas like that, um, and applying that to the, to, to the study of history. Uh, and that's quite a challenge, and that involves a certain amount of imagination from the researcher, because what you have to be able to do is to take into account both the advantages of the limitations of using geographical information or geographical information systems, types of software on the one hand, but also the traditions of history or whatever humanities disciplines you're working in in the other, and bringing those together. And that's not always as easy as it might sound. So just to, to work through in a little bit more detail what a geographical information system actually uh, involves having. Within a geographical information system, uniquely for uh, what makes a geographical information system unique then, is the fact that we have two types of data stored for each item in our database. And the item can be anything from a row of statistical data to, as I've said, something like images or uh, textual data or whatever. But we have two types of information for each feature within that database. The first is the conventional type attribute data, which says what the feature is. And so that might be our statistics, our text, or whatever. But the second is, uh, is spatial data, as it's, uh, as it's referred to, and that says where the feature is. And that's always based around coordinates. Without getting too technical, it, too much into the technicalities of it, that can come in two forms, so-called vector data, which are either points, lines, or polygons, which are used to represent things like administrative units, uh, areas of one form or another. Uh, and on the other hand, we have raster data, which is used to represent a continuous surface. Um, I'll give examples of those two in a minute, but there's just a couple more types of uh, type bits of jargon that I guess I need to introduce on the way. The first, uh, I'm trying to keep the jargon down, but uh, there's a little bit that really needs to be there. The first is so-called georeferencing or georeference data. Spatial data has... Uh, to make it useful, has to have some sort of real-world coordinate system under it. Um, so georeference data simply means that the spatial data has something like latitude and longitude, or universal transverse Mercator projections, British National Grid, whatever it might be. But some form of real-world projections, uh, real-world coordinate system, real-world projection system associated with it. There are two real sets of reasons why that's important. For the first, uh, the first set of reasons is it allows things like distances, areas, and so on to be calculated in real-world units like meters or miles or kilometers or whatever it might be. The second is if you've got real-world coordinate systems under one data set and a real-world coordinate system under another data set, then you know where features on the two data sets lie in relation to each other. So you can integrate the data simply based around the fact that we have these coordinate systems there. So that's uh, georeference data. It simply means that we have real-world coordinate systems associated with our data. The second thing that we need to know about is layers, which uh, a layer is uh, basically to a GIS what, uh, what a table is to, uh, to a database management system. Data on different themes are stored in separate layers, and each layer is uh, georeferenced. And that allows us, as I'll talk a little bit more about, to build up complex models of the real world from bringing together uh, quite widely disparate sources of data. So this is an example of some raster data. It's for the area around Hastings on the um, south coast of England. Hastings is famous because it's the site of the most famous battle in English history, uh, 1066, when uh, the Normans, the Normans were basically French, but the English don't like the idea they were invaded by the French, so they called them Normans instead. Uh, the French uh, came over and invaded England uh, in 1066. Um, and this, uh, we were approached by a TV company uh, quite a few years ago now uh, to use GIS to try and mock up and model the battle site. And this is where we started. It might look like a rather unpromising uh, promising place to start, but it's what's called a digital terrain model or a, a raster layer of uh, data for the area around Hastings. 
basically the way this works although it looks like a map of relief of height the way this works is the study area is broken down into small pixels each pixel is about 50 meters by 50 meters and for each pixel we have a, a single numeric value which gives the height of that pixel it's ordnance survey data that's the britain's national mapping agency and the way this uh, data has been shaded uh, we've got the the doesn't show up very well under this projector but we've got a blue area down here those are sea areas, so they've got uh, a height of zero. And then as we get increasingly high up, uh, up to 174 metres, it's a very hilly area, Hastings. It doesn't get all that high, but 174 metres up here. Uh, we shade it in increasingly dark, uh, increasingly dark colours. So you get this impression of the relief of the, the, the way the contours work around Hastings. But uh, it's not actually a map as such. The important point is the study area is broken down into pixels. Each pixel has a value, and that allows us to produce this kind of map-based representation of it as a kind of continuous-looking surface. So that's where how raster data work. Vector data works in a slightly different way. Vector data, as I said, models things either as points, lines, or areas. Uh, so this is an example of some vector data. Uh, again, for the south coast of England, this is the Isle of Wight, uh, Southampton, Portsmouth, for people that are familiar with that area. Um, and what we've got here is three layers of vector data. A point layer representing railway stations, a line layer representing railway lines, and a polygon layer representing parishes, which were a type of administrative unit that were used in 1911. And for two of those over here, I have examples of the attribute data that's associated with them. So with the railway stations, we have a certain amount of information on each station, such as a station name, stored as in tabular form. And for the parishes, we have some census data, which include things like uh, the parish name and the population in 1911, number of men in 1911, number of women in 1911, that kind of thing. Again, stored as numeric data. Important thing about this is if we were to click on a station over here, it would highlight which station it is on the attribute table, or if we were to click on a parish over here, it would highlight which, which polygon it is on the spatial data over here. And it's this combination of spatial and attribute data that kind of makes GIS what it is. And also, as you can see from this map, uh, from this, the, the spatial side of the data here, the, uh, the railway lines and railway stations were taken from an atlas published at an inch to the mile. The pa parish boundaries were taken from a very different series of maps uh, published at a uh, half inch to the mile, so about 125,000. Uh, but the fact that they both got British National Grid underneath them means that we can superimpose the railway lines over the, uh, over the parishes. And I'll say a little bit more about the importance of that in a minute. So the fact that we've got both attribute data and spatial data allows us to, to query GIS data in two different ways. We can either query it through the attributes and return the results uh, through a map-based form, or we can query it spatially by clicking on a map and return the, uh, the, spatial, the, the attribute data associated with it. So this is an example of this. This is uh, lung disease in England and Wales in the 1860s. We had some data from uh, the so-called Registrar General's report. The Registrar General was interested in mortality patterns, uh, and he published them using what are called registration districts, which are these administrative units you can see outlined here. Uh, and we had some data for those on lung disease through the 1860s. Uh, for men aged 45 to 64, that's the second half of their working lives. And what we've done here is an attribute query, which has just selected out the area with the highest rates of death from lung disease at that time. And the, they're, they're the ones that are shaded in black. And the pattern you can see is really quite striking if you know the, if you know the geography of Britain at that time. Uh, you've got the high rates associated with the urban and industrial centres. So this is South Lancashire, Liverpool, Manchester and into West Yorkshire. Uh, very heavy industrial area at that time. This is the South Wales coalfield. This is the area around Birmingham and the potteries. Again, heavy industrial areas. This is East London in particular being highlighted here. So we're getting a pattern uh, emerging very quickly showing that high rates of lung disease among men at this age uh, do seem to be associated with urban and industrial areas. But the other thing you notice as well is there are some exceptions to this. This area up here in the northeast was heavily industrial as well, but doesn't seem to have particularly high rates. And there are some exceptions to it. This area here, this area here, and this area down here that are quite rural. So as well as this immediate pattern that we might expect, 
We also have a pattern that perhaps we wouldn't expect. We have some outliers from that pattern. And we can follow those up perhaps by doing a spatial query, clicking on uh, an example of that, and that will return the underlying data of this place here. So that's uh, a place called Alston with Garrigill, and it actually gives you the mortality rate uh, from, the, from the underlying data. Um, we can also bring spatial and attribute data queries together in a slightly more complicated way. So say going back to our example of railways, um, uh, railways and parishes in the, on the south coast of England were interested in what railway stations lay within the parish of Portsmouth uh, in 1911. So the way we go about doing that is first of all we do uh, an attribute query to select out just parish equals Portsmouth and that's highlighted this area here, this single polygon here and also this row of data and then we do a spatial query to select out the points that lie within that particular, uh, that particular parish, that particular polygon. And we can see that there are uh, a total of eight records returned and it lists the, the names of the, parish, of the stations that were in that. And you can see that rather confusingly, two of, uh, there, were this, there were actually two stations with the same name, Cosham, at that date. And two, they didn't even bother with names, they just called them halts uh, and left it at that. But, uh, Key point about this is this ability to bring data from different sources together and ask queries that perhaps you wouldn't be able to do in any other way. I just don't think you'd be able to say what stations lay within this parish or perhaps what stations lay within areas with a, above a certain population density, these kind of things in any other way. When you're using GIS, you get a lot of maps that look a bit like this. Um, this is a so-called choropleth map, very widely used in historical geography before GIS came along and very easy to produce uh, when you're doing GIS. But if you think about it, a map like this is in many ways uh, simply, uh, one way of thinking about it is, is, is that it's a map, but another way is to think about it is it's actually a, a response to a database query. Because what it's done is said, it's this lung disease map again. It's selected out all of the parishes with um, a mortality rate of above 58, and it shaded them in purple. Then it's selected out all of the parishes with mortality rates between 38 and 58, shaded them red, and so on and so forth. Uh, and from there, we just get a bit more detail of what we had earlier, of high rates being found, particularly urban and industrial. And what we can see from this is much more that uh, lower rates are very much associated with the more rural parts of the country. But it's as much a database query as it is a map, and that's quite an important point to think about when you're uh, working with GIS. So that's uh, a very quick run through some of the, uh, some of the <coughs> technical aspects of GIS. Now I want to just switch quite quickly to some of the ways in which those, that functionality assists us in doing research within history and perhaps within the humanities more generally. I think what that structure gives is four, uh, what that technical platform gives is four areas of, uh, of advantage uh, that GIS has to offer to the humanities. It structures a database, uh, it allows you to integrate data, it allows you to visualise data, and it allows you to conduct spatial analysis. And I'll just g briefly give examples of all four of those. So the first one, structuring a database. Um, actually trying to think about data spatially has always been quite difficult. Uh, if you think about the old days where perhaps you'd have a map in a book, well, typically the map was very small. Sometimes it was stuck in as a fold-out at the back of the book. Very hard to move from uh, the information that's within the, 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 the more conventional book-based form and the map itself. And if you think about it from a library perspective, the fact that you've got, uh, typically you've got libraries and map libraries are actually separate collections, then bringing together uh, spatial data and, uh, or spatial ways of thinking about the world and, map, uh, and more conventional ways of thinking about the world is quite difficult. The, the way GIS allows you to structure data, it lets you get past that. And this is one example of doing that. It's the so-called Staffordshire Pass Practice. A Staffordshire Pass Track project, uh, which was a, a project done by Staffordshire County Council. Staffordshire is a, a county in England just north of Birmingham. It's traditionally quite an industrial area, Stafford, Stoke, uh, the so-called Potteries region. A lot of, t uh, a lot of ceramics uh, were made there uh, through the 19th and early 20th century. And they had a large database of images from Staffordshire's past, about 7,000 photographs, 3,000 images of artwork, uh, and various videos and audio files as well. And they wanted to put them up on a website for uh, the general public in particular to be able to access. 
So as well as the kind of conventional ways of searching it through things like themes, uh, through things like keyword searches and so on, they also wanted you to approach it from a map-based way. And in some ways it's slightly dated now, but I think it still gives a good idea of how this, uh, this helps you. So if you approach it through their, the map-based part of their website, to start with they just give you a very simple outline map of the, the county of Staffordshire. Uh, you can zoom in on this map, so this is the, uh, the area around Stafford, the county town uh, of Staffordshire. It's a modern map, so you can see the modern road layout. Um, and you'll also see that superimposed over the map, there are uh, one kilometre grid squares shaded from dark reds down to unshaded. Uh, and they illustrate how many artefacts are found within each particular square. So say, you can see there's a lot centred around Stafford itself from this. So say we zoom in hard on the centre of Stafford. This is a map of what Stafford looks like now. It's been quite extensively redeveloped in the 60s and 70s. Big roads have been push, pushed in, which wasn't there, uh, which wasn't there uh, previously. So they also include a historical map to show you what it was like before the redevelopments took place. Uh, this would be uh, an, an Ordnance Survey map from the late 19th century. But then critically, what they'll also allow you to do is explore the artefacts that were found in that area at that time. So these are uh, a list of the images associated with uh, particular themes uh, where you've got thumbnail images and metadata from that. And then if you click on one of those, it'll give you a bit more information about it. So this is a, an image of a, a fire in a glue factory that took place uh, in uh, 1901. Uh, and this is an image of uh, a medal awarded to the fire brigade as a result of some of the events that took place around that fire. So you're able to, to, to query the database through conventional ways of going about it. So for instance, I'm interested in the fire brigade, but also through map-based ways. So I'm interested in what happened in Stafford. Maybe I'm interested in what happened near Stafford. I'm interested in what happened in other towns. These kind of things. And you're able to bring these together to structure the data and query the data in, quite, in ways which traditional technologies, traditional database technologies, wouldn't allow you to do. Data integration, I've already spoken a little bit about that from a technical point of view, but thinking about what that has to mean to the humanities, uh, this is from Bertram MacDonald and Fiona Black's work uh, in 2000. They were, they're uh, Canadian scholars and they're interested in the history of the book, the spread of literacy in particular. And what they're trying, the point they're trying to make on this diagram is if you're interested in history, then you're interested in a study area that no longer exists. You can't, uh, th the past as it once was, which is this thing down here, no longer exists. All you can do if you want to understand that is bring together as many sources as you can to try to help you to reconstruct what that landscape, what that place was like at that time. So they're interested in the history of literacy, and what they, the, the argument they're trying to make there is if you're going to understand that in detail, you need to bring together a lot of different sources to do it. So particularly in somewhere like Canada, the New World at that time, uh, if you're interested in how something spread, uh, then uh, one thing that's of key importance is obviously transportation routes. Where do you get information on transportation routes? Well, clearly you get it from historical maps. So um, you start with historical maps, which give you information on transport. Then you're also interested in where people were and how people spread out across that landscape. So you're interested in demographic information, uh, like census information, which um, you get, again, from maps, but also from census data as well, and they're usually different maps. So you need to bring that in. Uh, if you're interested then more specifically in book production, in bookstores, in libraries, and other things from the history of the books, then these are likely to be available in things like trade directories uh, and, uh, and other sources like that, which will typically have place names associated with that. And from place names, you can start to look, uh, associate those with explicit locations. And bringing all those together through location, you can start to build up your picture of what the world was like at some point in the past. Data visualization, uh, as I said, lots of maps like this. If, you, if you're using GIS, particularly with quantitative sources, you start to see lots of maps like this. This is a map of infant mortality in England and Wales in the 1900s. Very high rates in urban and industrial areas shaded in green. Very low rates, or much lower rates anyway, uh, in rural areas. Uh, sorry, the high rate shaded in red, the lower rate shaded in green. When we produced this map, we were interested in contra contrasting the extremes, so we shaded those dark. The kind of intermediate areas uh, are shaded in light. 
white, they still earn in yellow, they still have rates of about 150 per thousand, which means about one birth in six ended in the baby dying before its first birthday. It's a very high rate even then. Uh, we're interested in this because it started to decline afterwards. But you get a very clear pattern of what's going on from that sort of map or at least you think you do. But in some ways, these maps are quite misleading because an awful lot of the people obviously lived in, in the urban areas and the rural areas were much more sparsely populated. So this impression uh, over here tries to work around that by distorting areas according to their population size. And you can see that the areas with very high rates actually had an awful lot of the people living in it. So an awful lot more people were affected by these very high rates and far fewer people were affected by these low rates than the choropleth map over here makes you think. GIS isn't just about choropleth maps, it's also about uh, other types of visualizations, virtual landscapes, fly-throughs, that sort of thing. This takes us back to, to Hastings, to the Battle of Hastings, uh, where we started with that raster uh, image that I showed you earlier, and we're able to transform that into what's called a digital terrain model, which gives an impression of the heights of the landscapes. It tries to give a 3D impression of what the landscape uh, is and was like. And we've draped a modern aerial photograph over that, in part because this road here uh, dates back to Roman times, and one theory behind the battle was that uh, King William's, ar the, the Duke of Normandy's army, who get, went on to become King Williams, were down in the valley here, and they wanted to get up to this road, um, which was up here, so they could break out of the area where they'd landed. Uh, and this was King Harold's army up here. So we're able to visualize this landscape in new ways. We're able to, I um, haven't got an impression of it here, but you're actually able to fly around it and look at it from different perspectives, and so on and so forth. So just to finish off, uh, spatial analysis uh, goes beyond mapping to try to actually use map-based data explicitly within uh, our analysis. This takes us back to two choropleth maps of infant mortality, the 1900s one uh, and the 1850s one. And we were particularly interested in this and whether there was a north-south divide or a core periphery divide in England and Wales. So uh, the theory being that areas around London, uh, there was quite a pronounced core periphery divide where areas around London were traditionally very wealthy. Uh, and as you moved away from London, particularly to the north, uh, areas became increasingly impoverished. And we wondered how that played out in terms of infant mortality because there's a link, quite well-defined link, between uh, high mortality rates and poverty. Uh, and we were wondering how, so how would this north-south or core periphery divide play out in infant mortality and how did it change from the 1850s <laughs> to the 1900s? If you simply look at two maps like that, it's very hard to answer that uh, because it's really not very clear. You can see there have been some changes in infant mortality <coughs> and, how, uh, and the patterns of it over that time period, but it's not easy to, to spot how, uh, how that, uh, either how those changed uh, how the changes played out, or how those related to a core periphery divide. So what these two maps try and do is just smooth that pattern out based on distance from London. Idea being that uh, if you have a core periphery divide, then London, the core should be good, and as you move away from London, you should get progressively worse. And actually, you can see by the 1900s, that's pretty much true. London's got quite in, uh, average rates. In fact, that's a bit misleading. It's got some of the best and some of the worst. But once we move away from London, we have some of the best rates. It gets increasingly worse until we get to about here where uh, you get to some of the worst areas. In the 1850s, you don't get anything like as pronounced a pattern. So what's kind of interesting about that is as transport improved with the development of the railways over this period, you're actually getting a more pronounced core periphery divide playing out in health effects than, than, uh, than we had previously. <laughs> Uh, and we can also uh, say that uh, we can also graph that, so it's not just about maps. This is simply showing how uh, between the 1850s and the 1900s, those buffers, as we say, some got better and some got worse. And basically, near London got better, and as we moved further away from London, uh, things got progressively, relatively at least, worse over time. Uh, so we have a, a growing north-south divide, and using the, manipulating the spatial data within GIS allows us to, to demonstrate that. So to try and sum that up, um, the advantages of GIS is it allows us to explore both the ge geographical and thematic components of our data, to stress, and that allows us to stress the, ge uh, the geographical aspects of our research questions. It allows handling large volumes of data and integrating it from different forms of uh, dis disparate sources uh, to go on and produce a wide variety of different forms of visualisation and analysis which explicitly uh, incorporates location. 
You do have to, however, think about the limitations of GIS as well. Da getting data into GIS is expensive and time consuming. The software isn't always easy to use and wasn't designed with historical research uh, in mind. So you have to work around that. And GIS is very good at showing spatial relationships, but it doesn't really generally provide explanations for those relationships. So you still need, although it's good at uh, <coughs> posing questions, actually answering those questions tends to uh, rely on us falling back on traditional scholarship. And the origins of it, as I've kind of uh, implied, come very much from the earth sciences and computer sciences. So you do have to think carefully about whether they're appropriate for uh, humanities styles of research as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ian. And during the coffee break, you'll have time to approach him. And we'll also, have, we'll also hear Ian talking more later on today. So thanks, Ian. And uh, we'll move to our, the last lecture in the first session by Professor David Bodenhammer. Professor David Bodenhammer is the head of the Polis Center at Indiana University, Purdue University in India, Indianapolis, leading many people, author of uh, many books, articles. And we will hear David uh, talking about more than GIS. Okay. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, although it's always a bit daunting to follow Ian Gregory, who is an expert not only in GIS, but in so many, in the application of so many different things. In fact, I sometimes feel like the last speaker had an Irish way, that everything's been said, but not everyone said it. So, uh, and yes, that is the name of my university. If, and here's a trivia question for you, that if you're a party and someone wants to know what's the world's longest name for a university, you know the answer now. <laughs> it is a pleasure to be here, especially my first time in Israel, and it's uh, really interesting to see how much the past presses upon the present, quite different than in the States where we try to obliterate the past as soon as something occurs. But what I want to do here today is to uh, take what Ian has said and suggest that GIS is essential, uh, is, is, is essential for uh, the study of the past, but it's not sufficient. And that what I think is happening now is the emergence of a new form of humanities known as the spatial humanities that incorporates GIS but modifies it and bends it to the needs of humanists. Well, clearly, we're in, we're in a new world. We all recognize that. And we have, for the past two decades, seen the effects of an ongoing revolution, which we have experienced. Data deluge, rapid knowledge discovery, step changes in technology that occur almost daily. We're in an age of ubiquitous computing. We are emphasizing interdisciplinarity in a way that we never have before. And we're also engaged now in a, in a period in which Everyone is an expert. Everyone contributes information to our knowledge base. And we have to learn how to accommodate that. And it's helpful for us, I think, to think about how we got here, how we got to this point, and what this suggests about, about the use of a technology like GIS in history and the humanities. We remember that we come out of a 19th century tradition that, in which history and the humanities sought to embrace some of the methods of the sciences, sought to embrace rationalism and empiricism, and this, in the 20th century, matures into specialized disciplines, uh, professionalization, a cult of objectivity, and the importance of experts. And of course, in the, over the past 30 and 40 years, we have been engaged in an epistemological shift, a shift in the way in which we construct knowledge and understand the construction of knowledge. We now recognize that, that the humanities can't be measured so precisely that we're in an age uh, in which we are interested in the subjective and the experiential, where, we're, where our emphasis is on fluidity and simultaneity, on multiplicity and diversity, where we, have a, where we recognize the importance of agency in all human uh, events and actions, and where we're skeptical, quite skeptical, especially of experts. Well, at the same time this is occurring, we've been in, we have been in, uh, 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 faced with a spatial turn. In fact, that's the, the terminology or the phrase that is often used to describe the importance, the increasing importance of our recognition of space and the influence of space on human events. Well, for the humanists, this is not a new thing. In fact, we have gone through a number of spatial turns as humanists, beginning in the 18th century when the modern humanities begins to emerge, 
with a problem around the problem of collective identity, oftentimes grounded in conceptions of landscape. Uh, by the post-World War II period, we have shifted our emphasis on space and the humanities to things like movement and exiles and borderlands. You and Israel experience this in a very personal way in a, a, within your history. And we've also begun to wrestle with different conceptions of space that are more metaphorical and symbolic. Notions of interior space or private space or gendered or racialized spaces, memory spaces, imagined spaces. All of these things have become important to the humanities. Well, now with GIS, which has been around since the 1960s, with its emphasis, as Ian has demonstrated, uh, its emphasis on precise and measurable information, the question arises, how does this fit with a postmodernist emphasis in which indeterminacy <coughs> is really the rule, not specificity, not precision? So can GIS, the real question I think we need to ask is, can GIS fit the needs of historians and other humanists? And if so, how does it do that? Well, it may help us to step back just a bit and to think about the current perspectives that engage humanists. And I've listed them here, multiple realities and independency, uh, multi multi-scalar and anti-scalar activity, hybridity and complexity. All of these things are the things that engage us <coughs> as humanists in our study. The, uh, I'm not sure what we have here, <laughs> but the, um, so, sounds kind of like my dog when, uh, she, when she's hungry. Uh, the, um, we're also going to have current themes that engage us, that are the themes of context and culture and convergence. And you see some of the variants of those themes there. And here I want to focus on the theme of convergence to explain, to explain how it is that we are moving towards something that I have called spatial humanities. And I want to talk about the convergence that is occurring in four different areas, in these sciences and digital humanities, in GIS and especially its application to history and the humanities and in Web 2.0. I think all of these things, the developments in all of these things are essential into leading us into, a, into an entirely new field in which we find GIS, but we fi and we find GIS at the core, but we don't find it as a, sufficient, a, a, as a sufficient tool for the things that we need to do. So let's talk first uh, just briefly about e-science, and I call, I really break it down into e-science 1.0 and 2.0. And e-science is the European term, the American term is that awkward term, cyber infrastructure in which we had focused especially in the 1970s and 80s on the creation of digital libraries. That continues, of course, and all of this is the, for the preservation, access, and exchange of data. And we've seen the results of that. You know, when I first began my uh, scholarly work, I would visit the archives and I would visit the library on a regular basis. And I find that I rarely darken the doors now because I can get virtually everything I need for my current work uh, at my desktop. Now, of course, e-science means grid-based collaboration, and you can see the various ways in which this collaboration is occurring, both in terms of technical collaboration and procedural and scholarly, as well as the ICT and discipline and domain collaborations that we experience daily in our work. In the digital humanities, the other of these areas in which we find uh, an, a, a maturity and uh, that is going to lead to this convergence, we have a particular expression of this e-science in in the creation of digital databases and scholarly editions and new tools for humanists, new centers and new positions. I don't know how it is in Israel, but in American universities, uh, the hottest uh, the, uh, field for humanists to be in is, are, are, is digital history or digital humanities. In fact, we at my university are now hiring another person in digital humanities, and we find that that uh, the three people that we have chosen to invite to campus have four other interviews each, and that's unheard of in, in the humanities these days. Um, and the results of this have been pretty, pretty remarkable. We've seen a number of scholarly editions and databases that come out of this. Some of them uh, seem to me quite central, and others really are quite uh, perhaps esoteric and appealing to uh, only a few scholars, such as the Medieval Crop Yields Database. I can't imagine many people using that one. Um, but also some very popular projects in the U.S. There was a project known as the Valley of the Shadow Project that, that provided access to, uh, to, especially to public school students as well as to scholars, uh, on a vast array of information about the Civil War, looking at two contiguous counties, one in Virginia and one in Pennsylvania. 
uh, during the five-year period that constituted the Civil War. And it allowed, there were 10 million users of this system by the time it finally was archived and placed offline. The, uh, the spatial turn in GIS has also begun to affect and lead to this uh, convergence into the spatial humanities. We know that there has been this increased attention to space and spatiality beginning in the 1960s, and we've seen the new technologies that support this spatial turn, especially the emergence of GIS. But as you might imagine, and it first occurs within geography, there is a critique of GIS that says that GIS re requires a precision that the world does not give us. It requires that data be measurable, and it be measured and me remeasured and remeasured in, in precisely the same way so that we can then take it and turn it into a map, so that we can analyze it spatially. Well, of course, the humanists will say, as well as did those people who, who come out of the social critique of GIS, say that that's not the way the world operates. The world is filled with ambiguity. It's filled with contradiction. It's filled with uncertainty. How does GIS handle this? And out of this comes GI science, which is an attempt <laughs> to keep the scientific rigor of geographic information systems, but at the same time make it accommodate the kind of uncertainty and imprecision that we know exists in daily life. Web 2.0 is the last of these, uh, uh, these four things that I think are converging into the spatial humanities, and we're all familiar with, we live with the web con uh, constantly now. I mean, it, it's such a part of our life, and I think the thing that is most interesting about it is, is its ubiquity and the fact that it is now mobile. But it keeps us connected in ways that we never have been before, and it provides a collaborative and open framework in which we work. And this has changed us in, a, in, a, in some remarkable ways. And here are just some of the platforms on which we are now working continually, oftentimes without even knowing it, oftentimes without even thinking about it consciously. And this has provided then a new framework for learning, and one in which we are emphasizing unstructured interactions without disciplinary boundaries, that is open to experiential knowledge, as a, not just simply expert knowledge, uh, in which there are also networked <coughs> participant collab collaborators. And this is beginning to really refocus, at least in the U.S., and I trust that this is true in Europe and in other parts of the world, it is really beginning to refocus the way in which we think about education itself, or the way in which we think about learning and what learning actually means. And out of this comes the spatial humanities, out of all the convergence of these four things. It begins, a special turn in the humanities actually begins in the 1990s. It doesn't begin in the 1960s as it does with geography. It begins in the 1990s, and we recognized as humanists that space offers us the opportunity, at least geographic space, for some really important things, things that are important to us. It offers us the opportunity for the integration of data <coughs> from disparate sources, as Ian demonstrated. It offers us the ability to visualize this information oftentimes in the form of a map, but sometimes beyond that, and it offers us ways in which to analyze the information that we have not taken seriously before. And it allows us to keep, to, to, it allows us in this analysis to keep moving from space to place, because it is place that interests uh, the humanist more, not just abstract space. And of course, Spatial Humanities 1.0 led to a variety of GIS facilitated tools and methods. As Ian, for instance, has been very instrumental in helping us to think about how it is that we accommodate shifting boundaries over time. I mean, after all, data are collected in these administrative units, and that's what we have to work with oftentimes. But these boundaries are changing continually. And so how do we know that what, we're, what is being reflected by the data represents, in fact, the same place that we're interested in studying? And of course, out of this comes a whole variety of new kinds of scholarship. Uh, in history and archaeology and cultural studies, and it is here where historical GIS emerges. We have rediscovered through this process the power of the maps, mm -hmm. and Richard White, who is an important U.S. historian who uh, actually was a pioneer in the field of spatial history, expresses it well, I think, and that is that relationships jump out at us in a map, where oftentimes we can't even describe them in a narrative without losing the reader, actually without even losing ourselves sometimes. The other part of this uh, Spatial Humanities 1.0 has been the creation of strategic spatial data sets. Uh, a lot of digitization has taken place of, say, of national censuses and other sorts of things that are important for the study of, 
of the geographic expression of events. Uh, we've seen a number of international collaborations, the Electronic Cultural Atlas Initiative, of which Ian and I, that's how we first met. Uh, there have been a variety of uh, UK, EU, and uh, national initiatives in the US. There have been a, the emergence of expert networks, especially in the European Union. And there have been a whole variety of national historical GIS projects. In fact, in virtually uh, every week, I hear of a new national GIS that is, uh, that is beginning or, or reaching some important milestone. And here are just some examples, a good example of uh, an international collaboration that has occurred around cultural atlases has been the Electronic Cultural Atlas Initiative that comes out of University of California at Berkeley, in which there are about 8,800 universities affiliated worldwide. There are the National Historical GISs in Germany and, and the U.S. and China represented here. Now, there is a notion of geo-rectified historical maps that are available, especially on the web, and many of you may know of the David Rumsey collection. Uh, he's a, a, a private uh, philanthropist who became interested in map collecting and decided he wanted to make his maps freely available, historical maps freely available, and you can download any of his maps already geo-rectified and use them uh, for free. Uh, and there have been a variety of uh, publications and projects that come out of this early expression of HGIS. <coughs> the Salem Witchcraft Trials, I'll show you the, the website of that in a minute. Some major HGIS projects at Stanford and in Philadelphia. Uh, the Holocaust Project, which you'll hear from Ann Knowles about this afternoon, and a variety of major publications and conferences in HGIS and the special humanities. And here is one of the early uh, attempts to take uh, uh, GIS data and apply it to a well-known historical problem. And here is just uh, Ben Ray from the University of Virginia does this, and he begins to locate the accusers and the accused in the Salem witchcraft trials of the, of the 1690s and began to see what the cor spatial correspondence was between them, the temporal correspondence. And it begins to illustrate that in fact many of these things because of the spatial proximity were probably dis as much disputes over land and the kind of neighborly things as they were. That's what prompted some of the spatial, uh, some of the witchcraft accusations. Spatial history project at Stanford has been very important in shaping this field. But the critique of historical GIS begins to grow, especially in the late 1990s and the early part of the 21st century. And it really centers around the same sort of critique that geographers made about GIS in the 1970s and 1980s that led to the social theoretical critique of GIS. And that is that what happens here is mostly mapping. This is really spatial primitives, putting a point on a map and calling it or, or, or giving a polygon. And the second critique is it requires a great deal of technical expertise to be able to use this information effectively and use these technologies effectively. These are lengthy projects. They're even the most, what seems to be the most simple historical problem when you try to move it into a GIS environment becomes very difficult and it becomes difficult to sustain this. And the sustaining is not simply your interest in the project, it's the collaboration that it requires. And in fact, that collaboration is, is becomes a major barrier, as we'll see in a moment. Um, the, the, what's happening here, is, the critique says, is that we're, we're, we're talking about space and not place, and yet humanists are interested in place. That is the particular expression of space and time. Uh, and then where is time in all of this? In fact, GIS doesn't handle time very well. So all of this leads to an unfortunate conclusion for those of us who think that this technology has much to offer the humanities, and that is not many of our colleagues are embracing it. It has a very scanty uptake by humanists, and we have to ask why. Because humanists are always grappling with place. They're always grappling with the expression of space in a particular time and a particular location. So why aren't they using this technology that allows us to manipulate space effectively? And the barriers, of course, is the systems. As I mentioned, GIS is a very complex technology. It's much more simple than it used to be, but it is still complex. The data, while there have been a creation of a lot of spatially enabled data over the past couple of uh, decades, there's still a lot that is not spatially enabled and cannot be used effectively within the GIS. The culture, uh, humanists are for the most part solitary scholars. And yet, to work within a GIS environment means that you are continually working with people outside of your domain. You're especially working with technical experts to help in this. And that's a difficult thing, because we would prefer to be in the dusty archives sometimes. 
the epistemology we've already mentioned, and the literacy, I think, is a big one. Well, for the most part, we humanists are not trained in spatial thinking. It's not that it, we don't, it's the, the spatial questions don't occur to us naturally. And we're not trained in visual thinking. And remember that most often, GIS inform, uh, the geographic information is expressed in GIS in the form of a map. And we don't even know how to read maps very effectively or construct them very well. So the question arises by a number of us who have been working in this area, why is it that we need a full-scale GIS to apply to history in the humanities? Perhaps what we need is a Pareto GIS, and here I'll borrow the term from a colleague and friend of mine who says that uh, he was struck by the fact that the Italian <coughs> economist uh, Pareto in the 1920s when looking at the landholding patterns of Italy over centuries noticed that 80% of the land was owned by 20% of the people, and that ratio held. It didn't matter when he looked at this, when he looked at this. And so he suggested that there would maybe a universal principle at stake here, that uh, we do, uh, in fact, my wife says that that's true of my wardrobe, that I wear, uh, <laughs> I wear 20% of my clothes 80% of the time. Um, but, you know, we don't really need the full analytical functionality of ArcGIS to accomplish what it is that we need, so we have to reboot. We have to move beyond ESRI, move beyond the standard GIS. And how do we make it truly multimodal? How do we make it open it to virtual research environments or immersive environments and cre cre create collaborative spaces out of it? And how do we develop a, a new epistemology around it, one that recognizes that the work we're interested in is nonlinear, it's fluid, and it's reflexive? And so here is where I think we come to Spatial Humanities 2.0. That is, in a, an explicit recognition of the reciprocal influence of geographic and constructed space, not just simply geographic space, but the way that we in our lives construct our spaces. These are oftentimes metaphorical spaces on culture and society. How does it embrace all of the spatial technologies, and not simply GIS, but bend them to our needs and not ask us to accommodate our needs to their demands? How do we make it truly multidisciplinary, and how do we leap time, space, and culture dynamically <laughs> by joining the humanities and GI science. What we're interested in really is something that goes beyond the map or creates the map in a different kind of way. And this is from Franco Moretti, who's very influential work for in called Graph Maps and Trees and other times in which he's helped us to think about how maps are really more than the sum of their parts. They embody emergent realities and it's the emergent reality we're really interested in. So it's here where Web 2.0 becomes important to the spatial humanities. If space is the meeting ground and offers an integrated perspective on place, then Web 2.0 is our toolkit because it doesn't privilege spatial technologies or quantitative data. And it offers the open participatory framework for experts and non-experts alike. And we begin to see already the ways in which this is being expressed. There's this notion of neo-geography, that is that each of us carry around our geographic imagination, our geographic understanding. And this becomes, we can contribute this and we can gain a much more enriched sense of place through this. We've seen the development of virtual globes and APIs and mashups and social networking, gazetteers, semantic searching, all of this are new approaches that lead to, I'm going to just run through a very quick series of examples because my time is running short, in which we see some of the ways in which these new we're beginning to move these technologies into areas in which we're much more comfortable. Here's a project by a colleague of mine at Purdue University, a nearby uh, state university, called Visible Pass, in which he became interested in how it was that you could use the mobile web to uh, create, in this instance, the landing beach at Normandy. So for all of the veterans who are now, uh, they're, before they are right in their last years, they're returning to, uh, to this invasion site where they participated. And he's allowing them on this to actually access the web and access all the historical information <coughs> about Normandy at the place at which that information is relevant. And he's allowing them to contribute their information to this to enter into a database which enriches our understanding of what was occurring in Normandy in 1944. Or virtual globes, and here the virtual reconstruction of no longer existing buildings within the spaces or environments in which they have occurred. Or spatial 3D, the reconstruction of uh, architecturally correct buildings 
uh, that, uh, that help us to understand something of the mass and the scale of previous spaces and places. Or spatial VR, in which we're beginning to think about how it is that you can take historical photographs, knowing where they're located, they become georectified and placed within the current environment so that you can begin to see. In fact, there are some really interesting apps now for those of you who are iPhone users and all where you can access this. And you can comb the comb flicker and other sorts of uh, services to begin to use these and begin to compare the past and the present in some interesting ways. Or immersive visualizations of my <coughs> colleague at West Virginia University my, and, and a center we call the Virtual Center for Spatial Humanities uh, has, um, has moved GIS into the cave into a computer augmented virtual environment so that you can put on your goggles and you can step into that environment and you can walk down the streets of Morgantown, West Virginia in the 19th century. And you can see the buildings there and you can see how long it was. This is a much different experience. <laughs> it, says, it says then that we're using these technologies to experience the past, not simply to analyze the past. Or there's the movement now into of GIS and spatial techniques into gaming engines, serious gaming engines. This is especially occurring at places like UCLA in the States. So what's happening today is the emergence of new and exciting forms of <coughs> convergence based uh, all focused on place and new types of scholarship. And we'll to run very quickly just through some examples of this. The Vision of Britain site is one in which Ian worked. They, they had a historical GIS of Great Britain in which they digitized a lot of census information and took some, uh, began to spatially enable this information and to reveal it on maps. And Ian has shown you some of the examples of that today. But now they moved it into a website where you can access this information by place along with some of the textual information and other kind of information that is available about those places over time. Or the complex visualizations, and this afternoon I'll speak more about this particular issue, how it is that we can help GIS show us more than it's capable of doing. Or mashup GIS, and Ian will talk more this afternoon about his project of the Lake Districts, or maybe this this morning yet, in which he's using computational uh, linguistics with GIS to help understand something about the uh, Lake District poetry. Or a are a platform that is developed at UCLA known as HyperCities. That, that is a GIS-based platform begins to accept and uh, all sorts of mapped and, and non-mapped information and helps you to keep track of that and to understand that uh, over time. And of course the new scholarship and quite obviously I prominently feature my book, The Spatial Humanities, uh, one I think everybody should have in their library. <laughs> Uh, new forms of scholarship that are coming, that is how it is that we blend all of this together in ways that are acceptable within the academy. New kinds of geovisualizations and interactive analysis, these are coming out of the Stanford Spatial History Project, or space-time networks, and exploratory spatial data analysis, and I'll say some more about that this afternoon <coughs> because we've begun to implement that in some of our projects. Notions of spatial complexity that we weren't able to grapple with before and new forms of mapping itself, such as the sound maps that, are, that have been pioneered in Great Britain, where we not only, where we can begin to access sound by location and understand something about the context in which things are occurring. New types of public history, where uh, we can walk through time by taking your sat-nav uh, device and usually on your iPhone or other smartphone device and, and simply use it to reveal the layers of time of, about the area that you're passing through and to access other kind of information to help you understand that. Contributed memories, there are a number of sites now, this one from New York City where people are contributing their memories of locations. Uh, this is that kind of, this is different than just simply mapping something that comes from an administrative data set. Well, this I think is leading us then into an a much richer, much more multimodal form of space in the humanities. And it, and it offering us some really interesting opportunities, I think, for life paths and spatial analysis, uh, spatial narratives, for networks, for virtual reality and gaming, and for, for deep mapping. So, and that's something more, I'll talk more about this <coughs> afternoon. Um, and the new vision that I think is emerging is that we're creating collaboratories, new types of collaboratories that allow us to not simply retrieve information, but to always keep it in a spatial context. 
And for the purpose of building hypotheses, because these are prompting new questions, allowing us to create flexible narration, not so that we have an expert narrative, but so we have multiple narratives. That's what we're really interested in because it reveals the complications of the world, the complexities of the world. Um, we're going to talk more this afternoon, something about deep mapping, but really it's a multi-scalar, multi-agent approach to all of this with a goal to reveal the contingent and the complex uh, context of events and actions at every scale over time. And, but of course, there are a variety of things that we have not yet, that we're deeply engaged in, especially some of these, these latter ones. And these are technical questions and as well as, as methodological questions, is how is it we, how do we capture metaphorical space? That's really important to us, but how do we capture it? How do we enable deep contingency? That is, we recognize that, that every action is the choice among a variety of possible actions. We know the choice, but how do we know what the possibilities were? How do we expose those in this environment? And then how do we understand the situatedness of the narrator in all of this? Um, we're coming to the end. So what we're dealing with, I think, now in the spatial humanities is moving well beyond GIS into a unique postmodern form of scholarship where real and conceptual space acts as an integrating and an animating framework for our scholarship. Thank you. <laughs>